How did life begin? Did you know that there are about 3 million different species living in the world right now? Species have different characteristics, different appearances, and most of the time, different systems and functions. They also have diverse characteristics. Some fly, some live underwater, some are single-celled organisms. Some others, such as plants, do not move at all during their lifetime, but they all have a common feature. They are alive. Did you ever think how these beings came to exist on Earth? How the basic elements in the body of each organism came together? According to the scientists, there are 114 elements in the periodic table and we have almost half of them in our bodies. These elements are completely inanimate outside the body. But how can they start to display the most intelligent and conscious behaviors on Earth once they enter the cell? An organism is a system where elements come together in a systematic manner to build the organs that work in harmony. In other words, life is, in fact, inanimate matter coming together and forming a perfectly functioning organism. However, like the impossibility of blocks of stone coming together and forming an organism, it is impossible for lifeless atoms to come together on their own and form living beings. Clearly, only God, with His superior might and intelligence, can turn lifeless matter into a living being. In other words, life can only be created. The miracle we witness here is nothing more than God bringing forth the living from the dead. I seek refuge in God from Satan. God is he who splits the seed and kernel. He brings forth the living from the dead and produces the dead out of the living. That is God. So how are you perverted? The origin of life has always been a source of frustration for those who subscribe to the materialist ideology because every living being is actually made up of lifeless atoms and acts like a living thing because God makes them. The number of elements present in the world is slightly above 100, as shown in the periodic table. The physical differences between them are due to the differences in the number of electrons and protons they possess. Different numbers of electrons and protons cause atoms to have completely different properties. But an atom does not have a mind of its own. The electrons, protons, and subatomic particles do not have a will or a power of their own. God builds the whole physical world with metaphysical power. Space, earth, atoms, and living beings can continue their existence every second only because God creates them every second. The first requirement for life is the harmonious movement of the molecules inside the body. Otherwise, there would be disorder, and without order, life would be impossible. By harmonious action, I mean a complete harmony in physical and particularly in chemical laws, God has created a myriad of laws that pervade throughout the universe, and all atoms act according to these laws. That is why you cannot see any structure in the universe that is idle or disorderly. God reveals in a verse,
He who created the seven heavens in layers, you will not find any flaw in the creation of the All-Merciful. Look again. Do you see any gaps? Now, to begin understanding life, let's first take a look at the smallest unit of life, the cell. As you know, bacteria are made up of only one cell and represent the biggest population of organisms on Earth. In fact, in my body alone, there are almost 10 trillion bacteria. The first thing a bacterium needs to survive is to be able to keep its components from floating away. For this reason, God created the cell membrane, which is the most essential structure that a bacteria needs. For example, let's think of a glass filled with water. If you turn the glass upside down without using a lid, the entire liquid in it will flow out. This is how a bacterium is. If the bacterium did not have a cell membrane, all the vital substances it contains would spill out. The most basic unit of living beings is the cell, and the door between the outer world and the cell is its membrane. The most important function of this structure is to prevent the negative conditions of the outside world from damaging the sensitive molecules inside the cell, and to enable the selective exchange of substances between intracellular and extracellular environments. Yes, the goal is quite simple. The function of a cell membrane is to prevent an uncontrolled outflow of the substances inside the cell, like the walls of a house. At the same time, it also prevents random substances from entering the cell. However, this structure is definitely not simple, and as we look deeper into the details, an astonishing world greets us. The molecular structure of the cell membrane is very complex. It spots the right substances the cell needs from among hundreds of different chemical substances and allows only those to enter. For this purpose, it uses various methods based on the sizes of the substances to be imported. The substances allowed to pass through the cell membrane include small molecules such as electrons, photons, ions, and water, medium-sized molecules such as amino acids and sugars, and sometimes large molecules, such as proteins and RNA, which require specific methods for their transfer. The cell membrane allows the small molecules it needs to be filtered through the cell membrane. Some molecules pass through the protein channels embedded in the cell membrane, while others can pass only with the help of a carrier protein. When the protein contacts the molecule to be taken inside the cell, the shape of the protein changes, allowing the molecule to pass through the cell membrane. Each protein in the protein channel has a unique amino acid sequence and size. Cell membrane proteins know which substances they should carry, and they are meticulous about their job. For example, the system that carries sugar will not carry amino acids. The carrier proteins distinguish between the two molecules based on their forms and atomic numbers. For example, if there is the slightest change in the geometrical shape of a molecule, despite having the same atomic number and chemical group with another molecule, the carrier system will detect it immediately and will not carry that molecule. The nucleus of the human cell also has a membrane around it and boasts a very unique structure. This place is given an extra protection with a separate membrane because the DNA is kept here. The DNA contains all the information necessary for the survival of the human body and this valuable treasure is carefully protected. Only the molecules needed for the DNA and protein synthesis are allowed to pass through the nucleus membrane. At this point, scientists discovered an amazing miracle. The pores responsible for the passage of substances through the nucleus membrane recognize proteins to be allowed in from their specific amino acid sequences. Neither the structure nor the size of the protein that will pass through the membrane is significant. For the nucleus membrane, what is important is this special sequence, that is, lysine, 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 arginine, lysine. If it is the right sequence, the pore will be enlarged to allow the passage. 
Scientists have yet to unravel the mystery of how the pores know about the size of the proteins without knowing their structure. The cell membrane alone shows the vastness of the information needed in the cell. It is obviously not possible for this wonderful structure to come into existence as a result of random combination of lifeless materials such as stone, soil, or water that are completely unconscious and have no knowledge. The most basic elements in a living organism are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, because they make up the proteins, which are the building blocks of life. Every process in the body requires the use of proteins. Proteins are needed every second in every cell. For this reason, there should be non-stop protein production in the body, and this production starts in the DNA. DNA has all the knowledge necessary to produce all the proteins that may be needed in the body. In the world of organisms, the information is stored in the DNA. DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid, the shape of which we were finally able to observe in 1950. DNA is a flawless data bank located in the nucleus and has the blueprint for each of the reactions necessary for life. Yeah, the, the amount of information found in, in DNA is extremely vast. Uh, it's much greater than even the most expansive volumes of an encyclopedia. It's just mind-boggling to think about the information content in DNA. And what's even more remarkable to me is the way in which the cell's machinery manipulates that DNA. DNA information is digital in nature, and in fact the cell manipulates that DNA in the same way uh, it manipulates, or, or sorry, in the same way that the computer system manipulates that digital information. And that similarity to me points to the work of the mind. It is as if DNA knows everything in advance. In truth, what we see in the form of DNA codes is part of God's knowledge. Now let's see what DNA and proteins mean. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is when you think about the way in which proteins are produced in the cell, it literally is like a factory operation where you have the making instructions housed in the DNA. And those instructions are copied and you're carried to the actual assembly line, which is the ribosome. And those instructions are used to build proteins bit by bit. But in addition to that, there's actually quality control systems that are checking that process from beginning to end to make sure that no mistakes happen. And if they do happen, to either eliminate the defective product or to correct it so that it can be still used uh, uh, for the cell's purposes. And that similarity between a manufacturing operation and uh, the way in which the cell assembles proteins to me suggests that there is a mind that is undergirding life itself. The entire information of life is encoded in the DNA, and the nano sized machines produced according to the information in the DNA are called the proteins. The production, that is, the protein synthesis, involves very sensitive and complex steps. In fact, it is similar to the production process in a factory. Now, let's see how this factory works. The cell, the basic building block of all living beings. And this is the nucleus of a cell. The nucleus contains all the genetic information pertaining to our bodies. Genetic information is stored in 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long DNA strand, which is packed tightly around proteins called histones. DNA contains gene segments, where the instructions needed to make proteins are kept. When a protein is needed in any of the approximately 100 trillion cells in the body, a signal is sent to the DNA via hormones. 
After that, an enzyme named RNA polymerase steps in to retrieve from DNA the information to be used for the protein. However, this is no easy feat as finding the right code needed to produce a certain protein among the huge database of DNA is similar to finding a single page in a 1,000 volume encyclopedia. However, the enzymes very rapidly read the information in the DNA from the beginning to the end and find the code quickly without making any mistakes. Only the relevant part of the DNA will be unfolded. The enzymes will keep the relevant part of the strand unfolded while the remaining sections remain in their folded form. RNA polymerase attaches itself to the starting point of this gene that contains the code and travels through the DNA and forms the messenger RNA using the bases that are freely circulating in the nucleus. The code in the DNA determines the order in which these free circulating bases are added to the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA now has a genuine copy of the necessary gene. Messenger RNA must go through a process before it can be used as a template for the protein production. In this process, some parts of the RNA are removed and spliced together. Now, it has received all the necessary information, no less, no more. With this important information, the messenger RNA is ready for the factory, that is, the ribosome, in which the proteins will be produced. The messenger RNA is now ready to leave the nucleus with its valuable cargo. However, there are gatekeepers waiting at the gate of the nucleus. They decide what goes into the nucleus and what doesn't, and open the gates accordingly. However, for the messenger RNA, the gates will always be opened. With the information it copied from the DNA, the messenger RNA goes straight to the ribosome and never gets lost. Ribosome is the factory that produces the new proteins. The messenger RNA binds to the relevant part of the ribosome and preparations begin for the production of the new protein. The ribosome, in other words the factory, needs raw materials to start production based on the information brought in by the messenger RNA. These raw materials are amino acids, which can be in 20 different forms in living beings. The ribosome knows what amino acids correspond to the letters sent by the DNA and allows only the correct amino acids to enter. It takes the ribosome only 4.5 nanoseconds, which is 4.5 billionth of a second, to identify an incoming amino acid. The technology and intelligence displayed by organelles, which are only one hundred thousandth of a millimeter, is spectacular. Thinking or even imagining that these details could come about by chance is obviously very illogical. Transfer RNA brings the raw materials and positions them according to the code. The instructions that contain the information for the production of the protein have arrived from the DNA. However, there is a problem that needs to be solved. The written instructions on the order slip are in the DNA, which is written in a special four-letter alphabet. The language of the proteins to be produced is completely different and consists of 20 different amino acids. In other words, it has a 20-letter alphabet. The conversion of this language difference is called translation. Ribosome performs this translation between the two languages. Called the codon-anticodon method, this translation system works much better than the most advanced computer centers around the world today. It acts like a professional translator expert in both languages. The messenger RNA that previously arrived at the ribosome, carrying the information for the protein production, and the transfer RNA, carrying the amino acid at its one end, find each other like a key and a lock. Within a very short period of time, the information written in the four-letter alphabet of DNA is translated into protein language. Amino acids attached to the upper end of the transfer RNA form an astonishing protein chain, each consisting of at least 100 amino acids. In order for the translation to function in the best way possible, the ribosome enlists the help of over a hundred assisting molecules, each of which works in concert with one another.
Protein synthesis is actually a translation process from one language to another. As you can see, our genetic information is translated from the language of DNA to the language of protein, and the translation is done by an organelle called the ribosome. Here, the amino acids are linked by special chemical bonds called peptide bonds, which are among the strongest bonds. For this reason, proteins are sturdy and are not easily damaged by external effects. After the new protein chain is formed, the chain assumes its unique three-dimensional shape through a series of folding moves. This three-dimensional shape will determine the quality of the protein. This shape is so important that the protein would be useless if this unique shape was not fashioned, even if the sequence was correct. With the formation of the special three-dimensional shape, the process is now complete and new protein is formed. When the new protein emerges from this special compartment, an enzyme on duty arrives at the scene. It picks up the resulting protein and takes it to its destination where it is needed. You know, when it comes to protein synthesis, you have what I would call uh, the queen mother of all chicken and egg problems. Because in order for proteins to be made, you have to have proteins in place. Uh, proteins are reading the information in DNA so that those instructions can be copied by the cell. Those instructions are carried by proteins to the ribosome. At the ribosome, which is made up of a large number of proteins, there are proteins that are assembling proteins themselves. And in fact, even when proteins begin to fold after the production, after their production, it's proteins that are helping the proteins to fold. So you can't have proteins without proteins. But the problem is even more severe for an evolutionary paradigm uh, because if you are starting off with proteins that are less efficient, that quote unquote evolved to be more efficient, that scenario could never work. Why? Because if you have inefficient, less effective proteins functioning, they're going to be producing defective proteins, which means in turn, the proteins that make proteins are going to become more defective. And when that happens, you have something that spirals out of control and is an effective death spiral for, for protein synthesis. So there's no way to envision how something like protein synthesis could evolve because of the chicken and egg nature of that. Right, so uh, protein synthesis is actually a fairly complex uh, series of events that occur within the cell at an incredibly fast rate. It involves multiple proteins that are necessary to transcribe the DNA into RNA, and then additional proteins that are required to translate the RNA into proteins. Uh, so protein synthesis actually requires both DNA, proteins, and RNA, as well as transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs, uh, the latter of which also include uh, different protein subunits. So uh, it's quite impossible to get proteins uh, without proteins already being in existence. The process of protein synthesis, which we tried to summarize briefly, takes place 2,000 times every second in every cell. All the units involved in the process are very well aware what they need to do. Not even a single enzyme gets confused about its goal. There's never a faulty production in the factory. The unique folding shape of the new protein chain is never wrong. The carriers and messengers never lose their way. The cell is always aware of the importance and sensitivity of this special production. It is aware because Almighty God inspires every component inside the cell what to do. Each enzyme, each amino acid, every atom that makes them up is the manifestation of the supreme power, endless knowledge, and the superior intelligence of God. Everything submits to God, who is the owner and ruler of all the worlds, who is everywhere and surrounds everything at all times. Everything is in His knowledge and everything has surrendered to Him. It is indeed very easy for all merciful God to create all these amazing wonders out of nothing.
It is not possible to explain such a complex system like protein synthesis with an evolutionary mechanism. Evolutionists are also aware that it is impossible for the protein molecule to come into existence by itself through a series of coincidences. The theory of evolution cannot explain how a single amino acid initially came into existence, let alone a protein molecule. Evolutionists have conducted many experiments in their attempts to explain the origin of life. The Miller-Urey experiment, which was conducted in 1953 and is their most respected study, is one of those efforts. With the experiment, these two biochemists hoped to be able to discover a finding that could suggest that the amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, could have coincidentally formed in the lifeless world billions of years ago. However, the experiment did not correctly mimic the atmospheric conditions and required plenty of external intervention. The result was the right-handed amino acids. However, organisms do not use right-handed amino acids. Nevertheless, the experiment revealed one truth. Amino acids could be obtained only in a laboratory environment, the conditions of which are specially arranged and through intentional intervention. Even the smallest protein molecule boasts incredible features, fascinating mechanisms and properties. It is impossible for lifeless atoms to organize themselves to form such perfect structures through coincidences. In other words, the power that gave rise to life was not unconscious coincidences, it was the creation. With the Miller experiment, evolutionists, in fact, refuted the theory of evolution with their own hands. Proteins are everything for living organisms. Almost half of your dry weight is proteins. For example, in an 80 kilogram human, if we assume that 60% of the body is water, we can say that the half of the remaining 32 kilograms, that is, 16 kilograms of his body, is pure protein molecule. So why are there so many proteins in living being? What makes proteins so important? Every activity you carry out in your daily life is actually made possible by the biological machines called proteins at the size of one millionth of a millimeter. The word protein usually brings a healthy diet to mind. Most people have heard that a person needs sufficient amounts of protein for a healthy body, but they don't know much more than that. However, proteins are miraculous molecules that show us important facts. These giant molecules, formed by the arrangement of amino acids according to a specific plan, show us the true greatness of creation. For example, the material called keratin, which makes up the hard structure found in the hair and nails, is a protein. Some other proteins form a strong elastic substance found in tendons that connect muscles to the bones. The material that gives the skin its smooth elasticity and the bones their durable structure is another protein called collagen. The rubber-like elastic material surrounding the arteries is another protein. The name of the protein that initiates the process of seeing when the light hits the retina is rhodopsin, while the transparent proteins that form the lens in the eye are called crystalline. Special carrier proteins are also involved in the entry and exit of molecules into and out of the cells. The DNA molecule, which stores the entire knowledge of life, cannot be copied, cannot produce information or enable cell division without the help of proteins. In other words, proteins carry out a variety of tasks, both in the structure and the numerous functions of the cell. For example, enzymes are also proteins and act as catalysts that increase the speed of chemical reactions in the cell by billions of times. Working in teams, they build all the chemical parts of the cell. In addition to their ability to build, they also have the ability to decompose compounds. They are able to break down the large molecules into simple compounds usable by the cell. In other words, they perform digestion. They are also responsible for reactions that generate energy for the cell. The molecules that enable muscle contraction are also proteins. Simply stated, life would not be possible without proteins. Proteins have functions in every process in the body, from the nervous system, the digestive system, and the endocrine system, to cell division. A 
complete cell is needed for a protein to be produced. It is impossible for a cell to come into being gradually, as evolutionists used to claim. It is either all or none when it comes to proteins. It is again the proteins that build the proteins from scratch. In other words, not only do they undertake every task in the body, they also produce proteins. So protein synthesis is a job that can be done only by proteins. A total of 4,500 proteins are involved in the process of protein synthesis. Throughout the process of protein synthesis, the presence of a myriad of proteins is necessary. Molecular biologists have carried out numerous experiments to see if it was possible for the proteins to form through coincidences. Among these are famous scientists such as Harold Morowitz, Fred Hoyle, Ilya Prigogine, Hubert Yockey, and Robert Sauer. Despite the fact that they are evolutionist scientists, the conclusion they reached is that it is not possible for proteins to have come into existence through coincidences. In order for proteins to be produced, other proteins need to be ready at the scene to help this production, because the things that synthesize proteins are again, proteins. In that case, proteins cannot exist without other proteins that existed before them. This proves the fact of creation and that proteins were created at once and without any gradual steps. Now, let us briefly summarize why other proteins must be present in order for a single protein to be formed and see the properties of the amino acid chains that make up the proteins. One. Of the over 200 amino acids found naturally or artificially in the world, only 20 can be used for protein production. Therefore, the right 20 must be picked and set aside from among the 200 varieties of amino acid. 2. Some amino acids are right-handed, some are left-handed. The selected amino acids must be left-handed and never right-handed. This is because in nature, only left-handed amino acids can be used for protein synthesis in organisms. 3. Amino acids should not only be left-handed, but also they have to be in the right sequence. 4. Every process necessary for protein synthesis that we briefly summarized requires a protein. For the process of copying the relevant information from the DNA and for hundreds of different processes, the relevant proteins need to be available. 5. To synthesize the copied information, the cell organelle called ribosome is required. The ribosome contains ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNA. In other words, proteins must be readily available for the ribosome itself to exist. 6. There is also a special section in the ribosome that binds the amino acids, and it is called peptidyl transferase. This section is isolated from outside. This is a hydrophobic environment, which means that water cannot enter here. This is precisely the most important condition necessary for the binding of amino acids to one another. Here, the ribosome enables the peptide bonds to be formed, and an amino acid chain can be created. The theory of evolution that was developed in the 1800s was a big lie right from the beginning. In fact, Charles Darwin, who proposed the theory, also knew this. He has many statements about the difficulties of the theory, but I want to share a specific one. I cannot anyhow be consented to view this wonderful universe, and especially the nature of man, and to conclude that everything is the result of brute force. I am inclined to look at everything as resulting from designed laws. All these laws may have been expressly designed by an omniscient creator, who foresaw every future event and consequence. The more I think, the more bewildered I become. I am conscious that I am in an utterly hopeless muddle. I cannot think that the world as we see it is the result of chance. So information is an absolute necessity. The information regarding the laws that bring together the molecules, amino acids, proteins, the information regarding thousands of different biological processes like intracellular respiration, 
and metabolic activities, and information regarding many countless other details are only a few examples. Also in the macro world, visible to our eyes, the actions of animals and plants are always coordinated and purposeful. But, but certainly if we look at individual organisms, uh, I think the beauty and the intricacy and the complexity within individual organisms and those that live in sort of a symbiotic relationship or in areas where uh, nature perhaps is at its best, that I, I think that reflects what uh, the Apostle Paul refers to in Romans 1 verses 20 through 23 that everywhere we look in creation we see the handiwork of a creator to such an extent that we cannot just know that God exists, but we can even know the divine nature and eternal power of God in a way that is obvious and that we should not deny. Uh, so I think, I think nature, when we are in harmony with it and when it is in harmony with itself, that it, it points directly to God and the existence of a creator in a way that should draw our hearts and our minds and our spirits towards him. Let's talk about the first living organisms that existed on Earth. They are the source of oxygen that we breathe. They are the creatures that provide the plant roots with nitrogen. They are called cyanobacteria. God created these bacteria 3.5 billion years ago, and since then, they have been doing their job in an excellent manner. If it were not for them, no living creature would be technically alive today. But what are the features that make them so important? Right, so uh, the bacteria you're referring to have been evidenced in the, in the fossil record at least 3.8 billion years ago uh, in what are called stromatolites. And these are basically uh, mounds of petrified sedimentary uh, layers that have been laid down over time by, by bacterial mats secreting uh, compounds that, that basically solidify into rock-like structures. Uh, so, no, uh, the simplest bacterium that we know of, the most minimalistic cell, uh, which is a small bacteria, uh, contains over 380 different genes. And of those 380 different genes, um, we still don't know what about 140 of those do. So it's a highly complex organism uh, that has a very uh, complex genome. So they're not simple organisms, and it's uh, apparent that there were probably more than one type of bacteria in the early fossil records. And so we have a diversity, uh, we have a complexity, even at the simplest and earliest life forms. The free nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere are one of the basic elements in proteins. Plants cannot use this element directly. Therefore, cyanobacteria, with a process called fixation, convert it into a form that can be used by the plants. Cyanobacteria carry out many different cellular activities in the same cell, such as protein synthesis, photosynthesis, respiration, and nitrogen fixation. In order to do all this, they use a three-layer membrane system, called the outer membrane, cell membrane, and thylakoid membrane system. This whole membrane system makes cyanobacteria the most complex member of the bacterial kingdom. 3.5 billion years ago, which is a period of time the evolutionists try to dismiss as primitive, God created the most complex member of the bacterial kingdom. These bacteria have accomplished such great things that if it were not for them, it would not have been possible for any living creature to survive today. Now let's talk about the properties of cyanobacteria. They alone can photosynthesize and produce 30% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. Their DNA contains information about specific proteins that protect them against the sun's harmful rays, and they can filter out ultraviolet rays. But proteins produced by some of their species render many viruses non-functional, 
including the HIV virus. They can protect their own species against danger by producing toxic substances. They have the ability to adjust their metabolic activities according to the sun. In other words, they possess a circadian clock, which can only be found in multicellular organisms. The nitrogenase enzyme they use the most to fix nitrogen is much faster and more efficient when compared to the industrialized fertilizers today. It is because the same process requires a temperature of 400 degrees centigrade and a pressure of 200 to 350 atmospheres in a factory, whereas cyanobacteria can perform the same process easily at normal temperature and under normal pressure. In this documentary, we talked about the fact that life can only exist through the will of God, and that God created the whole world and everything in it for a purpose. There is not a single simple structure in either single-celled or multi-celled organisms. On the contrary, there is an extraordinary technology in all of them. All systems exist as a whole and can only function when they are complete. This is the only way for life to exist. The mind that created all these things belongs to Almighty God, who is all-knowing and has infinite knowledge.